Mark Schaefer, we are really excited to have you in the Leadership Greater Washington community, sharing some of your wisdom and insights with us. Well, thank you. It's it's great to be here and uh, and 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 an honor. So, um, yeah, so let's talk a little bit about connecting the dots between uh, generative AI, uh, community, and marketing. And what I'd like to do is start off with a, a little story. Um, when uh, ChatGPT was introduced, I, I wrote a, a blog post and used the words that I've never used before in my life. Everything changed forever in marketing that day. Even when the internet started or social media started, it took a few years for us to figure out what's real. How are businesses really going to use this? And we were able to take classes and attend seminars and it, it, it sort of worked pretty uh, slowly over a period of years. We started to figure out how we were gonna use this for business. Now, applying artificial intelligence in a method as simple to use as Google is revolutionary. And, it, and I could see the revolutionary opportunity. So the week it was introduced, I called up a friend of mine, very famous tech analyst in New York named Shelly Palmer. Maybe you've heard of Shelly. He, uh, he has been on the Today Show, uh, very well-known tech analyst. Shelly has blogged for almost every day for 15 years. And he said, Mark, let me tell you my experience with ChatGPT. It was terrifying. He said, I asked ChatGPT to create content for me, to create a blog post about the legislative ch challenges that Facebook is facing in the American Congress. I asked it to write the blog post in the voice of Shelley Palmer and to create three major points focusing on this challenge. He said, it did it. It did a beautiful job. He said, and here's the part that was really terrifying. It did the research to find the specific number of the legislation that Facebook was facing. He said, that's research I would have had to done. I would have had to do myself. He said, I am 80% replaced. Quite a stunning idea. Quite a sobering idea. Now, but here's the most important part, I think, of Shelley's characterization of his generative AI experience. What's the 20% that's not replaced? What's the 20% that's going to be sustained and important? And that's the part AI can't touch. And as professionals, I think this is something we all need to keep in mind. So I'm starting to like connect the dots here. Uh, Mahan said, you know, he loved my book, Known, which is about personal branding. So let's now connect the next dot. So Shelly says he's 20 he's he's 80 percent replaced but Shelly's not worried about AI I'm not worried about AI maybe there's there are some of you that aren't necessarily worried about AI because you've spent the time building your personal brand you're known you're trusted maybe you're even loved Shelly isn't going anywhere People are going to keep reading his blog. People are still going to be looking to him for truth. So the the, the personal brand takes on a new, a new role, a singularly important role in the world of generative AI, because we are on the cusp of some really perhaps disastrous consequences. Uh, I attended... Uh, a session at South by Southwest last year 
led by a futurist company. And what they do is they look at every single mega trend and they project into the future. What's the probability this will move towards something good? What's the probability this could move toward something bad? And for AI, it had the highest rating for something bad. And that comes in with deep fakes, with misinformation and deep fakes. It gave the rating, it was like an 80% probability that we were gonna have serious societal problems because of misinformation and deep fakes. But that makes us more important if we're beloved, trusted, and known. So when I talk about being known and having a personal brand, you'll be relieved to know this doesn't mean you need to learn dances on TikTok. It's, you're, you don't have to be famous, right? It's just being mindful and systematically uh, evolving around your presence, your authority, and your reputation to help you just help you have the best chance to do your job, whatever that job might be. It could be build a business, create customers, spread your ideas, attract money for nonprofits. If you're known and other people aren't, then you're going to have a better chance of, of winning in this world. And as far as I know, and I'm open to challenge, certainly questions on this, I've studied this a lot. I think this idea of having the personal brand is the only opportunity we have to fend off AI. You've all seen the same graphs I have from Deloitte and Accenture saying, here are the job categories that are most likely to go away in AI. It makes everyone, everybody want to be a forest ranger or work on a road crew. <laughs> but many white collar knowledge knowledge worker jobs are going to be threatened to some extent by AI, and it's already happening. As far as I know, the only defense we have is to build a strong personal brand, to be known, to be loved, to be trusted. Now, let's connect the dots in another way. How does this connect to community? The purpose of a brand is to build to create customers and to re retain customers by building a strong emotional connection between what we do and our customers. You might think about Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola, it's one of my favorite companies to study because they have a product essentially that can never change. Their job is to make that product relevant to every generation really relevant every year, really relevant every month. It's about creating that emotional bond in a relevant way. And that's what we need to do for our businesses, for our companies, and, for, and also for us. Now, a lot of people, how, how did we do that over the years? Advertising, right? Advertising. That's whenever I say Coca-Cola, most people say, polar bears, right? I gave a speech in Poland before the pandemic. I said, whenever I say Coca-Cola, what do you think of? They said polar bears. Even in Poland, they think about polar bears. Now, why is that? Because of this repetitive image that makes us not think about sugar water and makes us think about these warm and inviting, happy polar bears. The problem is that opportunity is in a tailspin. We don't see ads as much as we used to. We don't believe ads hardly at all. So we're spent, we're in a streaming economy where we uh, we watch Netflix and we watch Disney Plus, we watch The Mandalorian, we watch you know Amazon Prime, and we never see ads. We listen to music all day long on Spotify. We never hear ads, or we listen to audiobooks and we never hear ads. For, for young people today, especially, their consumption of advertising is down 95%, you know, compared to five or 10 years ago. So we've got to find a new meaningful way to connect with our, our customers in an emotional way. 
Many companies are using social media to do this. Uh, and certainly social media, creating content, there's a big role of generative AI, a very helpful role in many cases with generative AI. Uh, in social media, however, we don't have a strong opportunity to create a strong emotional bond. Many of you creating for social media might think, I feel like I have a message, I'm throwing it out in a bottle. I don't know if anybody sees it. The beauty and power of social media, however, is the opportunity for connecting with people uh, like Mahan and I, right? I mean, we've probably connected originally on social media and now we're creating content and collaborating together. It's very, very powerful. So social media is a great opportunity to make that initial connection, but it's not the strategy. It's the beginning of a process. We now connect with these people on social media and we invite them to subscribe to our content as a person, as a brand, as an organization, as a nonprofit. Do we have a blog? Do we have a video? Do we have an Instagram account? Do we have a podcast? Now we have reliable reach. It's not like throwing a message in the bottle anymore. We know who subscribe to us in a virtual way. They're saying, I have an emotional connection to you. It's okay for you to send information to me. I believe in you. I like what you're doing. I love your products. I love your services. I love what you stand for. Now we have an audience and an audience is wonderful. Unfortunately, this is where most businesses and most organizations stop. And they're missing the biggest opportunity, the most overlooked opportunity in the history of marketing opportunities, and that's community. So let's talk about what is the difference between an audience and community. And we're going to tie all these things together. There's three big differences between an audience and a community. An audience might be someone who reads my blog. They don't know each other. Or someone that listens to my podcast. They might love me and my content, but they don't know each other. So there's this sort of one-way emotional connection. When people join a community, they begin to know each other. They become friends. They become collaborators. They become confidants and something magical happens. You build an emotional layer of switching costs between you and your competitors because if people leave a community, if they have to leave a brand and leave the community, they're leaving their friends and they're not going to do that. So literally, they belong to the brand. So in this world of AI and world of streaming content, this is a new, powerful, perhaps the, the most powerful way to, to, to connect with customers in a meaningful, emotional way. So that's difference number one. In a community, there's actually communion. People know each other. Number two, there's a purpose. There's, there's a, you have to have a reason to connect, a reason to meet. So how do your, I'll, I'm gonna say customers, but I know there's a lot of different organizations here. It could be your donors, it could be your students, it could be your you know, faculty or whatever it is. How do your customers, How what do they want to do? How do they wanna grow? How do they wanna learn? What do they wanna build? What do they wanna change in the world? And is there an intersection between that purpose and your purpose? Can you have more impact on the world? Can you achieve more if your customers come alongside you? That's a good indication that you have a shared purpose. It's a reason to meet. The most, you know, a very simple, well-known example of that would be Patagonia. When I say Patagonia, you immediately know their purpose and what they stand for. I have a friend, he only buys Patagonia because he believes in what they, they he's in their community, 
and just believes in what they do so strongly. It may not be the, the, the cheapest clothing or the most beautiful clothing, but he knows what it stands for and he be believes in that purpose. And then the final difference is when in our marketing, we might have a marketing point of differentiation or a mission statement. But in a community, the community kind of takes us to new ways, to new ideas. It evolves, it moves us forward. It helps us be relevant. A small example from my community, which is dedicated toward learning the future of, of marketing together. It's free, it's open, it's on Discord. We have people in there from all over the world giving me new ideas about what they see and what's happening. I started my community thinking, oh, well, people will be interested in what I'm interested in. So let's start a chat room on writing books and giving speeches and personal branding. And those are the emptiest rooms in the whole platform because people said, no, we need to learn about the metaverse. We need to learn about Web3. We need to learn about AI. That, and, they're, and that's where they're taking me. Now think how that can scale for you and your company and your brand saying, look, you want to be relevant. Here's how, here's how, here's how we're going to take you. It's powerful and it's so exciting. So I hope that helps a little bit. I, I uh, committed to Mahan. I would just talk for maybe 15 minutes or so. I think I'm, I've gone over time a little bit, but I'd love to hear your comments and questions. So that's sort of like how we connect the dots between AI, the opportunity, the threat, personal branding, and community in terms of this emotional connection, emotional continuum for our marketing strategy. So Mahan, I'll turn it uh, over to, uh, to you. Yeah, Mark, that does an outstanding job of presenting the flow of thought. And there is a question on AI that I'll get to in a couple of minutes, but I wanted to mention a couple of things in asking your question. A lot of people and leaders who are involved in Leadership Greater Washington understand that value of community you're talking about and that stickiness of community because LGW has that. One of the challenges that I see is transferring that to their own organizations. So how can you have a community that people want to be involved with? That's one question. Then another question, this is uh, whether a challenge with LGW or other organizations, how do you then let the community evolve and run rather than trying to manage the community? Yeah, great question. So the, the first place to start with a community is your culture. The, your, your culture is your marketing. If you have a culture that's like always be closing and, you know, marketing and sales is coin operated, you know, every coin we put in, we need to get more coins out. You may not have the culture that can sustain a true brand marketing initiative. You know, the example I give in the book is like Gatorade versus Powerade. Gatorade has 80% of a $30 billion sports market because they're, they're, they don't give coupons and they don't have end of aisle displays and they don't have a lot of discounts, but they sponsor stadiums. They sponsor teams. They, they're, they're, they're relevant to sports culture. And here is the biggest uh, example of this. Uh, last year during the college football playoffs, there's this tradition in America where, where if someone wins an exciting game, the players will sneak up on the coach with a big vat of Gatorade and dump it over their head. It's called the Gatorade bath. So in an, and it was an unusual circumstance where one of the games was actually sponsored by Powerade, the competitor. The players snuck up on the coach. They had this big blue vat of Powerade. And here's what the TV broadcast announcer said to their national television audience. Here comes the Gatorade bath. <laughs> so that's brand. That's the power of brand. Does the Gatorade bath sell more Gatorade? Yes. Can you measure it? No. 
So it takes a certain patience, vision, and leap of faith to really support brand marketing in your company. So that's really where it starts is, is the, um, is, is, is the culture. Do you have the culture that's willing to invest in, in the long term uh, connection? And what was the second part of your question? Well, I, I, along with that, though, I would love to, you also in the book have a couple of great examples of smaller organizations, because I oh, find sure. the, the Gatorade example is outstanding. But a lot of times people say, oh, my God, that's not us. We are a, a small for profit, nonprofit. Sure. Uh, well, one of the things in the book that I, I I was very intentional about is providing a lot of diverse experiences. So the largest community in the book has like would be Twitch has like, you know, maybe 50 or 60 million people in it. The smallest community in the book has 50 people in it. Um, there's a, 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 a successful community led by a stay at home mom. There's communities with real estate, there's there's a community in the book featured um, about uh, for nonprofits. So there's examples for for everything, and and to me, it, it really represents the 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 future of of marketing. I'll give you a quick example. In chapter four, I highlight um, an entrepreneur, uh, and it's, it, I've written ten books. This is the only chapter devoted to one person. That's how impressed I am with this person. But it's a great case study. And in 2015, my friend uh, Dana uh, was had a business. She was very successful and she got pregnant. And part of her friends were saying, well, you can't give up the business. And part of her friends were saying, well, you've got to be a mom. She said, I want to do both. So she created this community called Boss Mom. Long, long story short, Boss Mom now has 80,000 members. Dana is growing very, very quickly. She's got a million dollars in revenue a year from this community with no sales, no sales team, no marketing, no advertising, no marketing budget. All of her sales come through the trust and connection from this community. That's, it's like the ultimate marketing with no marketing. She'll never have to worry about SEO. She'll never have to worry about branded content. She'll never have to worry about Facebook ads ever. And her community, she doesn't even promote the community because people are so excited about what she's doing. They bring people in organically. It grows and grows and grows. She introduces a new training program. They all buy it because they love her and they trust her, right? That's again, connecting the personal brand with community built on trust. So do you believe, Mark, then uh, all the uh, LGW leaders organizations uh, could have a community of their own? Because we have, we have limited, we've limited timing, interest to be involved in different uh, communities. So uh, 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 do you believe that everyone who is at this point uh, uh, and thanks for saying hello, uh, Edwin, like, uh, uh, including Edwin can have and build a community for their organization. Yeah, that that's, that's a good question. Um, and one I've thought a lot about, and, uh, again, I, I think a lot of it is, is determined by the culture, but when I think about, could any company build a community? I always come back to one word, Yeti. So Yeti is an ice cooler. And about six or seven years ago, I started seeing people wearing t-shirts and hats <laughs> that said Yeti. And I thought, is it, wait, isn't that an ice cooler? And it was, it was an ice cooler. And this is a company now, it's a massive company uh, with lots of products on the store shelves. But for the first at least five years of their company, I haven't studied it so much lately, but I know for the first five years of their company, they did no advertising. It was 100% built on community. 
I was at an event, I gave a speech and there were university students there and they wanted to have their picture taken with me. So we all assemble. And then this young woman, she's like 19 years old, holds up her smartphone to take the picture. On the back of the smartphone, it says Yeti. Now, she, you know, I'm thinking, can she afford a $400 ice cooler? And I said, I just have to ask you, why? Why Yeti? And she just went on to say, I'm part of this community. I, be I believe in what they, you know, what they stand for. I believe in how they, you know, making products for the outdoors and the quality and everything they put into it. And I want to be part of that. And I don't have much money, but at Christmas every year, when I buy gifts, I buy Yeti. So again, she's telling the story of Yeti. That's the true marketing power of community because you create advocates. You create people who are telling, we don't see ads. We don't believe ads. The trust isn't there. Trust in businesses and brands and media and government have gone down, 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 but we trust each other. And when our friends and family and neighbors say, we love Yeti, we love Patagonia, we love, you know, leadership creator Washington. You've had experience that you have that yourself for LGW, right? That brings in organic growth and 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 trust, like any better than any ad you could ever have. That's uh, that's uh, exactly the point that I got from uh, whether reading Known Marketing Rebellion and then uh, your latest book, uh, Mark, in that every organization can do what. I'll relate it to LGW because everyone here is associated somehow with Leadership Greater Washington. Every organization can have that. And there are people that would then uh, be attracted to that community. They become the champions. So yeah. I would bet the people who've been involved in LGW, none of them saw ads because we don't run ads. Right. Each and every one of them was told by someone who is a passionate community member of LGW, you need to apply. You need to be part of this. What you do brilliantly, Mark, is build that bridge that that's not just for organizations like LGW. Every one of our organizations can do that. And yeah. that will be the only way of marketing moving forward, especially in this age of digital and now AI. Yeah, I first wrote about this idea in the 20, the Marketing Rebellion came out in 2019. And there was a chapter in the book about belonging and community. And I predicted it would play a big role in the future of marketing. Then a year later, the pandemic hit. And people were telling me, Mark, all these ideas that you had in your book, they're coming true right now because all we had, you know, well, all we had left was community. People surged into online communities for support. And so I think the average user of Facebook, I think they belong to an average of five groups, something like that. So, I mean, we do have a, a, of a, capacity, a, a high capacity, especially now when we have so many people, and you, you see this in the news every day about these, this, these record levels of, of loneliness and mental health problems and isolation and depression, people are longing to belong. And if you create a, a community that helps fill that need, that helps make them feel safe and valued, um, then they're never gonna leave. And uh, I, I would love to touch on some more elements of that community, but I wanna also be respectful. We have a question on, AI and want to incorporate that Great. in here. Great. Uh, in your view, and I, I know in addition to the comments that you made, Mark, you've uh, gone deep into content creation and thinking about AI in different ways. Um, how will deep fakes and AI impact government and policy? How does local governments become prepared? Well, it sort of gets back to this idea of, of community. Um, one of the ideas I'm seeing is that in the future and maybe now, community plays the role of sense maker. 
So I don't understand what I'm seeing. You know, I just saw, um, oh, what was the thing that went viral this week? Somebody um, got uh, kicked off a channel because he was creating deep fake images of politicians having affairs. So um, now we were lucky in that case that, um, you know, this, you know, this joker went viral and, you know, there was an example, but that was national news. But in a, in a local, in a local city or a local community, there's, there's, there has to be a place where people can find the news. There should be, you know, hopefully there's some sort of community, online community um, for every organization, for every city where people can go and say, is this true? And they've established this trust. Um, so that's that's where I think the, the things come together. Yeah, and it's it's really important, Mark. And one of the things that I tell a lot of leaders, and we're gonna see an incredible amount of it before 2024. I've seen deep fake videos, not just audio, not just pictures, deep fake videos at this point, and this is not uh any necessarily governments needing to do this anyone out of the basement of their parents' home can yeah. make anyone else do anything or say yeah. anything. Right. So our likelihood to not be able to trust whatever we see becomes higher, therefore relying on our community. In some instances, it can be positive, in other instances, negative. But it is something that is uh, the technology is there, the availability is there. We're going to see a lot more of it over the coming year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There were there was already uh, an incident in a, in Atlanta that there, like this this riot kind of started because of misinformation and some deep fake that people perpetuated. And um, so you know, it's it's there's got to be policy answers. There's got to be technology answers. But I think where the most opportunity is, is, is a community answer. Um, I, I think we've seen the government is way behind um, in addressing this. The technology can't keep up. I read an article last week that um, they've got all these things that can sense the deep fakes, whether it's written content or, or um, some sort of image. But all you have to do is manipulate it a little bit and it fools all the sensors. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know what a government solution might be. I, there's no laws or very few laws. Let alone, there's not even regulations right now. Um, and there's not a technological solution. So there's going to have to be somewhere, a place of trust we turn to, to make sense of, of what's happening. And it's probably not going to be Twitter. <laughs> you know, it's got it's got to be some sort of community. So with that uh, transitioning back to the community, uh, you have a great uh, quote from Tom Peters also at the beginning of your book. There is no business excellence without community excellence. From the communities you've studied and the leaders at LGW say, okay, Mark, I buy it. In order to uh, promote my organization, my brand, I need to think in terms of community and establish community. What are the patterns you've seen with that of the excellent communities? What do the best do to make their communities thriving communities? Yeah. Well, the first thing is they'd have to change your premise. Okay. Because <laughs> your premise started to promote our companies, to promote our brands. Everybody's sick of that. Nobody's gonna come to a community to hear you promote your brand. And um, that's gonna be a short-lived community. So it has to start, like, like I said, there's gotta be like the shared purpose. Let me give you another example that may make this easier to understand. It's very non-intuitive, but it's magical. So when I was interviewing a friend of mine for the book, she just mentioned off offhandedly that her favorite support system for women in business 
is M.M. Lafleur. I said, what's M.M. Lafleur? She said, it's a clothing brand. But their community has become like a LinkedIn for women. She said, I had a question I had about, you know, how you know, should I give my presentation this way or that way? She said, I'm almost embarrassed to say this, but I went to this clothing community. Now, what lesson can we learn from this? M.M. Lafleur and their customers have a shared purpose. M.M. Lafleur sells clothing for professional women. They need those women to succeed, for them to succeed. Women want to succeed in business so they can buy those clothes. That's a shared purpose. Now, in the community, they do talk about clothes, but mostly it's a safe place for them to support each other on a shared purpose. It's not to promote the brand, it's to promote the customers. So in, I, I, I appreciate your clarification on that. In doing that, you need to let people who love the brand, uh, uh, who love you, run with it rather than control it or dictate where things go. To how to how can you do that? Yeah, to a point. And, and I'll give you an example from my own experience. So this is one of those like non-intuitive leadership aspects of community where um you know the the, the woman i mentioned dana who has the eighty thousand people in the facebook community she has no staff it's it's all managed uh through volunteers who she elevates and and rewards and and dana says my number one uh role as a leader in this community is to make this place safe. And so for me, you know, in my community, I say, look, we have zero tolerance for toxicity. We, we talk to each other in this community like you would talk to your mother. And um, if, if somebody goes off the rails and they wanna do it another way, I say, well, you have a valid perspective and I respect, you know, your perspective and tone. However, maybe you should start your own community because that just doesn't fit here. You know, other people maybe have been disrespectful to people, others in the community. I'll take that comment down and I'll say, look, this is why we're just not going to have that there. And the people come back and say, yeah, I don't want that either. I'm sorry. You know, I'll do better. And then they and then they flourish. So um, it really gets down to, you know, finding the purpose, that intersection um, that, that will give people a way, uh, a, a reason to come to see you every week or every day, but still helps your business or your organization. It can't be overt selling, but you're, you're learning something together. You're becoming more relevant together. Um, and then create the culture, create the safety. The third thing I would say, Mahan, is um, to uh, what I've found is to make do something fun to involve people to make them want to be there, especially at the beginning. So at my in my community, I bring in guest speakers like you're doing here for your community. Um, We've had joint projects. Some of the people in our community created a podcast together. We've written a book together. We're gonna to be working on an AI project together. We have experiments in the metaverse. We have parties in the metaverse. So we learn, you know, how do you move in the metaverse? Last month, we learned how to clap. Big breakthrough. <laughs> But that, that provides a shared experience, a shared victory. It, 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 it brings them together in a fun way. And uh, so those are the three big things I would focus on. Outstanding. There's one other area I would love to get your thoughts on, Mark, before starting to wrap up. Uh, content has been the basis of the internet as we know it at this point. And right now, 
literally with giving a couple of word prompts, you can you can write books, which is Amazon is being overwhelmed with uh, AI yeah. written uh, books, yeah. let alone content that's ending up on the internet and on the websites. Would love to hear your thoughts with respect to the future of content and the future of websites and internet as we know it. Well, I know it seems this like completely, you know, overwhelming. And uh, I was reading something interesting about the historic um, famous library of Alexandria in ancient times. And their goal was to have every book in the world in this library. It was like the Google of its day. And I think they had like 100,000 books in the library. So if you walk in the library and, and you 100,000 books, that's too much. <laughs> even in even in ancient Egypt, there was too much. So it's, it's a matter of, of scale, whether there's you're competing with a million blog posts or a billion blog posts written by ChatGPT, who cares? It's still too much. I, I do believe there's still room for everybody. Absolutely, I do. And it gets back to that 20% we talked about at the beginning of our discussion as like, what is it about you? What is your uniqueness? What is your story? What is your heritage and your education and your network and you know what is it about you and your unique voice that you can bring to the world there's only one you even if there's a million of of other things and i think if 10 years from now if we look back at today we we'd say oh wow the internet was really just starting and the people and the ideas and the content that are going to have the biggest impact on us 10 years from now haven't started yet. It's, it's probably going to be at least a couple people on this call today that are going to be out there 10 years from now having that impact. So, I mean, I, I, it may seem impossible. It may seem daunting. I don't, I don't think it is. It's, I think it's the same problem we've had since ancient Greek, but, but the magic of today is it doesn't matter who you are or where you are, or how much money you have, or how dark your life has been in the past, you still have an opportunity to, to create your own influence, to create your own impact. For you, your business, your brand, your nonprofit, you still have that opportunity, and you still have your an opportunity to create your own audience and your own community. That's a, that's a beautiful and powerful message. I want to ask you now, uh, Chris Morrison, who is a well-known brand that I love, one of the best architects with some of the oh, best fantastic. work. Uh, Chris asks, is there a drawback or risk that all of this is device and technology dependent or are the devices, uh, sorry. Devices and technology and new form of communication. Yes. Yeah. That's the way I look at it exactly, Chris, is you, in the last, the last part of belonging to the brand, I talk about the future. And if you think about it, uh, uh, Silicon Valley and Wall Street, they're, they're putting so much money into new ways for us to connect. I mean, uh, there's whole communities built on NFTs, built on Web3, built on the metaverse. My communities in Discord didn't even really exist in any meaningful way two years ago. And uh, there's good implications of this. There's bad implications of this. But, but most of it is good. Um, and here's how it, why it's important in a culturally relevant way. So many people today, they don't want the public exposure of LinkedIn or Twitter or Facebook. They want to be in communities where they can be safe, where no one's going to judge them. That's healthy, I think. And a lot of this technology is going into creating these communities. My Discord community, we have people from all over the world with smart ideas and smart conversations. And guess what? Nobody can see it. 
It's a digital campfire. So the good part is that technology is enabling healthy, meaningful communities and conversations. The bad part is brands can't see them. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, Mark, I want to mention uh, again that I think your book, Known, is... Uh, was an outstanding, one of the best books I had read on what I saw as personal branding yes, as becoming exactly. known mm -hmm. and is more relevant uh, today, uh, six, seven years after you wrote it than ever because yes, of the uh, pr proliferation of all this content. And uh, uh, Marketing Rebellion is outstanding on the marketing front and belonging to the brand. The challenge I want to throw down to everyone is that if you love LGW, and I know everyone who is associated, watches this, is involved, loves LGW, if you have an emotional connection to LGW, then think about the power of that community and recognize that we all have the power of that community for our organizations as well. So really appreciate you, Mark. Uh, with your uh, uh, outstanding content and taking the time to share some of your wisdom with the Leadership Greater Washington community. Thank you so much, Mark Schaefer. Thank you. Thanks for your great questions. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you. Everyone, wonderful seeing you. I see you in person at the happy hour, end of summer happy hour, and see you for the, our next virtual session in September.